Whoa, good morning. I'm back. It's been a couple weeks, so thank you guys for uh, staying with me. Good morning, it's uh, Father's Day weekend, so happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. If my dad's watching in uh, Richmond, Virginia, happy Father's Day, love you. Uh, he might be watching on his little iPhone, um, but he, I don't know if he knows how to chat yet in the uh, chat. But happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Uh, first, I want to give a shout out to uh, Tony Tone Tones. Tonski is legit, uh, who was here early morning. Uh, we had a little, um, little uh, chat going. Uh, ben Coombs was here early. Kirk R., good morning. Uh, Matt Della Hunt, good morning. Medicine Man from the Apache Dine Nation in Arizona, good morning, brother. Um, Sean Walden is here, good to see you again. Brian Landreth, good morning. Painkiller1972, good morning. It's good to see familiar uh, faces, but I should say um, uh, avatars. Uh, Murray Williams, good morning, Ron Cilios. Uh, Rodora Perez, hey from Manila, Kumusta, welcome. I don't know if you've been in my chat before, but uh, what is it there? Is it evening there in Manila? I don't even know. So I only have, I have some family in Cavite, Naik, which is outside of Manila. If, uh, anyone that has ever been to the Philippines, I've only been there once, but um, most of my family is there in the, uh, uh, in the uh, countryside, I guess. Um, who else is here? Um, Paul P. Man Howland, good to see you. Bam is here. David Lissuk from Bakersfield, California. Aye. I love Bakersfield. Uh, Matt Harrison, Pete Bialk, what up? Lefty Mike. Nist Guy, Jacob Pacheco, hi. Enrico Durante, hi from Italy. Good morning, or good uh, afternoon there. Buena tarde? That's a little Spanish. Uh, BC Rich likes my Beetlejuice shirt. So my buddy, uh, I've been getting a lot of comments on some of my videos that I've been wearing this t-shirt. So I have a friend named Jonah Nimoy, who's an excellent artist, but he's also an excellent musician. Um, he was actually, him and I were covering on the Stone Sour gig uh, last year. Um, he did the first half, I did the second half. Amazing guitar player, amazing drummer, musician, teacher, frontman. Um, I think he's actually on tour with The Offspring right now uh, as kind of their utility guy. But he's also a great artist and he makes prints and t-shirts. He just had an art show recently in LA. Uh, but if you go to his, um, he's got an Instagram page trying to remember what um, what it is. But just look up Jonah Nimoy, and yes, he is related to the world famous uh, Leonard Nimoy. He, uh, he's his grandson, actually. So check him out. He's got t-shirts, he's got prints, he's got other th patches, stickers for sale. Really cool artwork. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Boredom Sketches. Go on Instagram, Boredom Sketches. His name's Jonah Nimoy. John Hopkins is in the house. Good morning, John. It's been a while since I saw you. Thank you so much for donating to the, uh, f okay, fun du jour. Uh, it might be tacos today, because I've got a little secret. I've got a friend by the name of Rhett Schull that's coming over after this, and we're going to do some talking for his podcast. So I don't know, there might be lunch, there might be tacos involved, but uh, thank you, John Hopkins. Uh, hey, I saw Kenny Wayne Shepherd and Buddy Guy on Thursday. Awesome. What are your thoughts on Kenny Wayne Shepherd? I find people either love him or hate him. So uh, I like Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and it took me a while to get into him only because, you know, when he first came out in the 90s, I would say, you know, here, Everyone was saying that, oh, he's just a Stevie Ray wannabe, which was common. Um, there were other, you know, when Eric Gales came out, he came out you know, in the 90s, around the same time that Kenny Wayne came out. People were telling, people were saying that he was, oh, he's just a Jimi Hendrix wannabe. And it, he kind of was as far as 
how he was marketed at the time. I want to say this might have been like 91, 92 or something. And I bought his album. I loved it. But you see Eric Gales now, and he's his own guy. He just kind of developed into this wonderful guitar player with his own style. He's an amazing uh, stage presence and everything. So I think Kenny Wayne did the same thing. You know, he kind of broke into the scene as being a guy that kind of sounded like a young Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, and, you know, as you get older, as you get more mature, he, he's, you know, you develop into your own style. Bonama Joe Bonamassa was the same thing. You know, he, when he first started, you know, coming out on his own as a solo artist, you know, he had his own thing, and then he, he got into this Eric johnson -y vibe, and now he's kind of melded the two, and now he's just, he's kind of got his own style. He's got, like, a little Clapton influence, but his style has changed over the years if you've been following Bonamassa since he was, you know, in Bloodline or whatever. Was that the name of the band? Bloodline? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I dig Kenny Wayne. Who else is here? The real Mang Mangubi. Good morning from San Diego. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit on my chat because I know I, I, I tend to uh, ramble. But thank you again, uh, John Hopkins. Um, and as always, if you want me to see your comment or your question, you can send me a super chat donation to the Taco Fund, Saturday Taco Fund. Um, or you can put a bunch of question marks after your comment or question and I might see it. Or you can highlight my name by doing the at symbol R period J period Ron Keel, like Mr. Jesse Lyles has done. Howdy from Texas, Jesse. Uh, Mick Hansen is enjoying the vids from Brooklyn. Thank you, Mick. Uh, Jacob Pacheco, Raw Dog is a badass, yeah. Raw Dog is Eric Gales' nickname. J Road 73, have you ever played in a punk band? Yes. So I played in a punk band in high school uh, in the Detroit area, but I didn't play guitar, I played drums. And in fact, I was cleaning out my garage the other day and I found the f our first flyer. I don't know if I can show it to you on camera, but the band was called One Way. Oh, you can't see this, can you? Can you see that flyer? So that was uh, in Detroit. We were opening for a band called Unwound, which I believe had some notoriety after that. But it was literally like a little, it almost seemed like a squatter's house. It wasn't a house, it was like in a warehouse district and they built kind of like this DIY punk club in basically a storage unit, a big storage unit. And um, we played there a couple times. And that club is not there. It was on Willis Street, which is in the Cass Quarter in Detroit, downtown Detroit. And now it's a boutique that sells like Prince memorabilia and stuff. It's cool. Um, so yes, good question. Uh, BC Rich is here. BC Rich 581. Why, who wouldn't want to be Hendrix or SRV? Not a bad pair to be compared to. Yes, I agree. And there's actually, there's actually uh, a lot of people, uh, I can't remember his name, that is basically kind of a Hendrix tribute artist, and he's made a living doing this. What's his name? You guys will think of it. He basically looks kind of like Hendrix and plays like Hendrix. Older guy. Um, if you think of it, tell me in the comments. Albus Band. Uh, Pro Analog Devices. Hey, good morning. Um, I still have your pedal, man. Is that, who is that, Scotty? Um, Anthony S., who are your punk influences? My punk influences are pretty much the old school guys. Johnny Ramone, MC5, um, I, you know, I don't really, I never really got into punk in the later years. I was listening to it, but I never really got into it as far as like delving, well, I don't know, I, got, I, got, I went through phases in the 90s listening to, who was I listening to, Lagwagon, I don't even know if they're punk anymore, um, like a lot of skate and surf punk stuff. Um, I don't know if you would call Social Distortion punk, but I guess some people do. Um, Rhett Shull is here. 
Red, I was just telling everybody that you're coming over. That I hope I didn't uh, give away any secrets. Trey Font Fontanet wants to know some cooking secrets. What's the best way to cook chicken if it stinks just a bit? <laughs> Barbecued last night with some slightly dank birds, but decided to just brine it for a couple hours. Um, throw it away and go to KFC. Don't, uh, don't risk. You know, the, the meat industry, especially in the States, is pretty uh, sketchy. So if anything smells or looks weird, I won't eat it or I won't cook it. Leo Milyong, how is it playing with Mark Agnesi, Art Menendez, Art Menezes, sorry, Guy King and Kingfish? That was a fun gig. That was, uh, so I, I did this little blues jam uh, during the NAMM show earlier this year with those guys. And it was fun. I didn't really, I wasn't prepared enough, but that was, that's fine. That's kind of what jams are all about. So it was more just a hang. Uh, I had never met a lot of the, a lot of those guys. Actually, I, I've only, I had only met Art in person at that time. I never met Mark, Guy, or King, but uh, we were kind of chatting online. So we were virtual friends, I guess, before that. Quentin James is in the house. All right, I'm gonna fast forward because I feel like I'm missing. Uh, Bam is asking, I see that Bam, thank you for tagging me and Rhett. How's each of your Novo builds coming along? Uh, I'm sure Rhett was just there. I was there when, Wednesday, and they're coming along. Uh, I haven't edited a, a next video yet, but I can tell you that I started on the neck uh, construction. We put the truss rod, we glued the truss rod in. Uh, and I have to go back because it's kind of a multi-day process with the neck. Uh, but I did get the, the body sanded and I filmed that and it's an, a very interesting process. Some of it, some of which I can't show you because I didn't film because it's a secret, but it's super cool. I never saw, I never, I, you know, I've never been to a guitar factory before. So I, I don't know how things are made. And I've, I haven't learned about this stuff, so it's really cool for me to see it, and then really cool to show you guys. Uh, J Road 73, last of the best Detroit area punk bands is in Stooges. Yeah, I mean, I would say, okay, Stooges MC5, done. Anything after that, uh, I'm not that interested. So yes, Lawrence Petras is here, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for gracing us with your presence before, before you teach today, because I know Saturday you do some teaching. Um, did I skip somebody that tagged me on something? Let's see here. Randy Hansen, yes, P-Man, got it. Randy Hansen was the Hendrix tribute artist that has been around since, I would say the 80s, 90s, uh, that nails it pretty much, you know? And he's made a career of doing that. Randy Hansen, good on ya. Uh, okay, I see, I'm gonna skim through some of these questions, so I, if I miss some of them, I apologize, but you can send me a super chat. Uh, I got some stuff I wanna talk about later. Tentatively, this video is gonna, is gonna be called My Weirdest Guitars. So I'm gonna show you a couple of my guitars that you may have seen, and probably one that you've never seen. Uh, that's kind of my weirdest guitars that I own. So stay tuned, don't go away because we're only 15 minutes into this chat. Um, Brian Coat, best guitar store in Nashville. Looking to find a gold top with P90s, R6 or R7. So, okay, with P90s, I would say that would be an R6 or an R4, right? Because the reissue R7s are gold tops with humbuckers, if I'm not mistaken. So, Carter Vintage is my favorite guitar store. Um, there's a lot that I haven't been to. I've never been to Rumble Seat. I've never been to, uh, there's another one. But between, if you're thinking between Carter and Groon, I prefer Carter, but that's also because I know some of the people that work there and they've been friendly to me. And I feel like it's a little more, they have a lot more inventory out in the open. Groon has, Groon's has a lot of great rare stuff, but it's locked away that you kind of have to make an appointment to see. And it's a lot of stuff you can't afford. I mean, I can't afford it. But if you go to Carter, they've got like 
you know, a range of prices. They've got new stuff now. They sell like new uh, Revolta guitars um, and a couple local builders as well. But so they have new stuff that's moderately priced up to like, you know, 59 uh, Sunburst Les Pauls and stuff. So, and it's a cool place to visit. It's just, even just to look and walk around, it's really cool. So Carter, uh, Rhett says his build is going well. Can't wait to see the Rontilio. Me neither. I think uh, we um, when I left, Dennis and I were talking about colors. So we're tr really trying to nail this Rontilio thing. So I sent him a, uh, my water bottle and my phone case and they kind of look similar, but this is slightly greener and this is slightly bluer. So we're going for something in the middle and with a little bit of a surprise, it's not gonna be just, you know, bright teal. It's gonna have a little bit of, little bit of flavor in there. I think I just spit. Um, I don't know, mine's, I think once the color, once the paint is done, it's gonna be pretty much bing, bang, boom, almost done. So I think Rhett's and our, and my guitar are gonna be done around the same time, which is coming up in the next, I would say, where are we, June 15th? Within the next couple weeks to a month, I would say it should be done. Um, okay, some more questions and I'll show you some of my weird guitars. Um, Bam Mozzie says, maybe a double jam session? Yep, that'll happen. If you're in, uh, in town for the Summer Nam, uh, we might be doing a get together and jam and with our new guitars, kind of like a, uh, a little Novo hang. I'm not sure if it's open to the public, but hit us up. Maybe we can get you in. Um, Bach Talk 55, which Eastwood guitar is your favorite? Um, it's been my favorite forever. It's the uh, Eastwood Tuxedo. It was my first one, and it's kind of like the one I always say, this is my favorite Eastwood, and it still is. There's a ton of great Eastwoods that uh, are coming out. I, I don't know if you follow Eastwood on YouTube, but they just released a couple more videos that I did. And one of them, I don't have, yeah, I returned it, but it's a, uh, you remember that Robin Ford model that Fender put out? It was like the Esprit Ultra. It's basically like a double cut solid body, but it almost had this weird offset 335 feel. Uh, they're putting, Eastwood is putting out uh, their version of it, and it's like 500 bucks or something, and it, it plays actually really, really good. Uh, made in China, um, you just kind of have to tweak the guitar a little bit to play well, but it sounded great. So if you're like a big, the only thing that I didn't like is it only came in one finish, which was like a cherry burst. I think the original Robin Fords had just like a, like a standard sunburst or a tobacco burst, uh, so I wish they would have had a secondary paint job. Maybe in the future they'll have a, another paint scheme for that model, but it's a cool guitar and it's 500 bucks. Uh, but check that out on, on, on Eastwood's YouTube channel. Tim Farnsworth, good morning from Pismo Beach, California. I'm jealous. I've never been to Pismo Beach, but I hear it's really nice. Um, okay, Tony Tones wants me to do a, a mixed surf green Daphne blue like on Tom DeLonge's Strat. I feel like Tom DeLonge's is a little on the green side. I just want this vibrant, I say neon teal, but I just want this, this teal that, that totally jumps out. I mean, obviously if you're colorblind, you're not gonna see it, but you know, for the non-colorblind people, this teal that kind of just like burns your eyes. Same with this neon pink pick guard, I spit again. Same with this neon pink pickguard that I want. I just want everything to pop and be like annoyingly colorful and contrasty. So that's the goal. Uh, Bam is in the UK. Whilst he'd love to be at Summer Nam, uh, it's an uh, incredibly unlikely. Hope you record a video of it. We will. We'll record lots of videos. Um, okay, Novo Bash, Red Shell. That's what it's called. Is that what we're titling it called? Titling it Novo Bash, Novo Fest. Um, okay, so I'm gonna 
let you guys chat amongst yourselves, and I'm going to talk about the weirdest guitars I have. Uh, this one, you've probably seen in some of my older videos. Um, this is a Hallmark. What is this called? Stradette. This is quite possibly the ugliest guitar that I own, but it's so ugly that it's, it's cool. And it sounds phenomenal. I mean, look at this. This is not even an F hole. This is like a Z hole. Right? It's like a Z. Um, so the story behind Hallmark Guitars, if you've never heard of Hallmark Guitars, uh, Bob Shade, who's in New Jersey, uh, basically licensed the designs of, of Moserite and some other designs, but he also, I'll get to some other designs that he has in just a minute, but this was originally designed by a guy in Bakersfield um, named Bill Gruggett. And I believe, and don't quote me on this, uh, and I think Deke Dickerson knows way more about this, the history of this guitar, but um, Bill Gruggett, I believe, worked for Semi, Semi Mosley, uh, and did some designing as well. Uh, Semi Mosley, of course, is the guy that started Moserite Guitars. Moserite Guitars, if you've ever seen The Ventures, um, Johnny Ramone, um, Kurt Cobain mo used Moserite Guitars. Um, really cool guitars. So Bill Gruggett made this design. I'm not sure if he was working for Moserite at the time or this was one of his designs that he did after he left the company. But this is the Stradette. Uh, I can't really comment on the body shape. It's really freaking weird. It's like thicker up here in the horns. Um, and it's got this like violin cutaway. It's really obnoxiously ugly. Who, let's see. <laughs> I hope it has a great personality. This has a great personality. Um, it's a glorious kind of ugly, David France says. Yes. It's like if acid and guitar making <laughs> had a baby. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you're right. Uh, Matt Harrison, Moserite Hoffner Mutation. Uh, Tony is asking, the, the neck looks super skinny. Yes, it is on the skinny side. I don't know if you can, you can't really see. It's not uh, obnoxiously skinny, but the, the design, you know, this is like the Moserite Sandcast Tremolo, which is one of my favorite vibrato systems, more than a Bigsby, more than the Duesenberg. It's just something about the feel of this particular vibrato system. But it's got the zero fret. This one has a, a, a graphite nut. Um, I think usually Moserites have like a, a metal nut. Um, but here's how it sounds. <laughs> A really, this vibrato is so super. Um, what's the word? I'm, I'm looking for the word responsive. And it stays in tune pretty well. I haven't tuned this guitar in like months. And these pickups are really hot. You can't really tell because I'm going through a quilter amp, which is supposed to stay clean. I'm going to shut off the mic and just play a little bit for you. I wish I had, oh, I do have reverb, duh. So it, 
it does have like a, a, a Jaguar Jazz Mastery vibe. But this was never like a surf guitar. This was almost like a country guitar. And this was, if you are a fan of RJ and the Del Guapos and you own the album or have seen the album, the artwork is a caricature of me holding this guitar. Just because it's so funky, I had to put it on the album cover. So this is kind of synonymous with uh, RJ and the Del Guapos. So this is probably the first weird guitar that I've got. Um, and I have a couple hallmarks and they're all kind of weird, but I'm gonna show you. Are you ready for this? This is quite possibly the weirdest guitar I own. And I can almost guarantee that I've never put it in a video. I might be wrong. Are you ready? What the frick is this? Okay. We can talk about this. This is... And also, this is also a Hallmark guitar. This is the limited series Red Baron guitar. So, Bob Shade is not only a guitar builder and designer, he also does pedals, but he's also really into hot rods. And this was uh, inspired by the Red Baron hot rod car, um, which I don't know much about. Um, he, he, he did give me some paperwork, but uh, I forget the guy's name that designed it. But this is kind of a piece of <laughs> piece of work. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> it's not a Nazi thing. This is just like um, based on a hot rod um, design. So this, the symbol of your biker gang. This is just one of those, what, Iron Cross? Is that what this is called? Uh, but if you look closely, some of the accoutrements on this guitar. It's got these knobs that are actually like rubber wheels from like a, a model car. It's actually rubber and it's got, you know, the, the wheel itself has got that iron cross motif as well. And then check this out. This is a rotary pickup selector that's got like this badass. Can you hear me? I'm like not talking. Enough. It's got this badass skull it's a five-way, so I'll show you uh, what it does in, the, in just a minute. But this is also Hallmark's first guitar that has humbuckers. So you can actually do a little bit of metal. Um, the truss rod cover is like one of those helmets, German Bismarck, whatever, helmets. Um, I don't know much about history and all that stuff. But um, it's cool. It's got this uh, red... Sparkly finish, can't really tell. Um, same vibrato that they always use. This one actually does have a metal nut. Uh, and the uh, jack is in the back. The jack is in the back! So, I know you guys are so, are dying to hear how it sounds. Me too, because I haven't played this guitar in a while. <laughs> Some uh, uh, people that know what I'm talking about. Uh, that can't be comfortable to play. It's not comfortable sitting down. I think it's meant to be played standing up. So Bam is saying the Red Baron uh, was a German flying ace in World War One, uh, and that is shaped as a German Iron Cross. Some say Nazi, but it's not. It's just World War Two. Oh, that was World War Two. So this is World War One. This is pre-Nazi. Um, 
David Dare Parker, the original Red Baron's plane was relic by some Aussie machine gunners. Huh, I didn't know that. So while, so it's almost like inspired by something that was inspired by something else. So the hot rod car, I wish I had a picture. The hot rod Red Baron was essentially a hot rod car, but the top I believe had like the helmet that you can see here. It was um, in the truss rod, you know that, that strange helmet with the spike. I believe that was the top of the car, uh, like the hood, not the hood, but you know, the roof of the car. Um, Chuck Miller, there you go, Adam Henderson. Chuck Miller was the guy that did the Red Baron. Um, and so that car was based on the Red Baron um, plane or the, you know, that guy, the, what is he? German flying ace. So this is based on the car or, or inspired by the car, the hot rod. So it's kind of, you know, a double inspirado. Um, Baron Manfred von Richtofen. See, I didn't know that. I just knew a little bit about the, the car, the hot rod. I, I, I didn't know anything about the actual Red Baron, other than he makes pretty crappy frozen pizza. Um, I need one of those things. Um, the Iron Cross was awarded for about 100 years, never after World War II. Okay, good to know. See, I need to learn, I need to read more about history because it's very interesting. Um, Michael Parker had a Matchbox version of that hot rod as a kid. I do remember Matchbox releasing a set of hot rod cars in the 80s. Albus Band, I'm saying it's based off the frozen pizza. If they made a pizza guitar called the Red Baron, I'd be like, can you make a DiGiorno guitar? So yeah, this is probably the most obnoxious guitar that I own. And I never, I sh you tell me, should I start using this guitar in like my pedal demo videos? Who wants to see this? Who wants to see more of this? It, it sounds pretty good for not being set up or tuned in like years. So I was saying that there's a five-way rotary here, skull rotary. So I believe that position is bridge humbucker that splits it that split that's full this is the middle position what two of them this is the neck pickup split full humbucking I'll say this right now. I'm not a big fan of split humbucker sounds. I don't, maybe if in the middle position, if I could split the humbuckers to make it a little more uh, nasally, I would dig that. But like alone, I, I don't use, I never go to like a split humbucker sound for anything. It's always in conjunction with like a second pickup. But I, I, I don't know. What about you guys? Do you guys uh, ever play with your split humbucker sounds for anything? Maybe I'm just not using it right or the way other people are using it. Um, okay, I think I missed a couple comments that looked interesting or questions. Uh, Omri, Omri Cohen, if you're still here, I see your question. Can you talk about your jazz influence? Sure, I'll talk about my jazz influence. Uh, I started getting into jazz uh, probably when I was 13, so maybe three or four years after I started playing guitar. Um, and it was, I want to say it was more because I thought if I learned, like many people, I thought if I learned how to play jazz that I could play anything, which isn't necessarily true. There's definitely some theory that you learn that, you know, you don't learn in any other style. 
but the misconception that, oh, if I can play jazz, I can play anything, that's totally false. Um, if you can play jazz, you can play jazz. It's great. And you might be able to interject some of that, uh, the jazz vocabulary into like a blues or whatever, or rock or learn fusion. But, you know, just because you, you learn jazz doesn't necessarily make you a better player necessarily, a better musician. It just, it's just more information that you know. So uh, my early influences were probably, uh, you know, Wes Montgomery. <sighs> Who did I listen to? A lot of new guys, like I, I, I bought like a Pat Metheny album early on and I didn't really understand it musically. It was just shredding. Like I like the shredding solos that he did, which, you know, Wes Montgomery didn't do necessarily or in that type of style. But um, like early George Benson, like uh, when he was a young kid, those are great records. Um, who else? Joe Pass, I got sort of into just for the the uh, chord melody arrangements that he did. Um, Barney Kessel, Kenny Burrell. Um, I, don't know. There, I mean, there's so many of them. Basically, the st the early standard, you know, Grant Green, those guys. I would, st if you're getting, if you're wanting to learn to to learn how to play jazz guitar, start at the very beginning. You know, start with Django Reinhardt. Um, start with Les Paul, um, and then kind of go in a line, you know, go how it is, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and kind of explore that route. But, um, yeah, and if you're playing jazz, awesome, good luck. It's a, it's a long process, but it's very satisfying, and it's, it's so, there's so many things to learn um, about jazz that I'm still learning every day. So I see uh, somebody left me a, uh, Dietrich, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your taco fund money. Uh, what, what was the difference between the Palo Verde fuzz and the JHS foot fuzz? For me, JHS pedals have very low noise. Uh, I would say the Palo Verde fuzz has low noise. I don't have it. Do I have it available? I think I put it back there. Um, I want to say, you know, I, I never really did a, direct A, B comparison. So I'm only kind of going by what I remember the JHS mini foot fuzz sounded like. And I want to say that they were totally two different sounds. I could be wrong, but um, the Palo Verde fuzz uh, is exceptionally awesome as is, and I'm not just saying this because uh, Lawrence is probably in the chat. Are you still here LPD? But Every pedal that I've demoed for them, I've dug and I could, I've found a way to use it. They're all usable for me, which is kind of hard to um, find in a lot of pedals, especially when you get into overdrives and distortions because a lot of them do the same thing just in a different way. So I could get by with any of those, but there's a lot of cool qualities. Uh, and, and I say this about every pedal that I play. If I can dial in an awesome tone within a minute, two minutes, then I like the pedal. That's it. You know, it doesn't have to have a lot. In fact, any pedal that has a lot of knobs, I'm instantly not attracted to. Um, it's just something, and that, that goes with every gear, guitars, amps. If I can get a good sound, if I'm immediately you know, impressed with the sound or the way it feels, then I like it. You know, I don't, I, you know, if I have to spend a week with a guitar or tweaking it to get it to where I want it, then forget it, it's, it's gone. And I have a guitar, like my 70s Strat, if you've seen it, the black one, I've changed the pickups out, I've got it refretted. Um, what else have I done? I've changed the tuners, the, the bridge saddles. I've done a bunch of stuff and it's net and it hasn't, gotten to where I, I really love it. So I feel bad to sell it because I've done so much work on it, but it might be one of the ones to go. It's an awesome 70s Strat, but I just, I guess I'm not made to play those guitars. Uh, so good questions. Uh, Brax Stubblefield, uh, thank you. The Palo Verde, I've got some more LPD demos that uh, Lawrence doesn't even know I've 
I have. I haven't even showed you, Lawrence. But I, I got them all. Even the ones that he won't let me show you. Because they're secret. Um, Braxel is asking, do you like the Analog Man Sunface? I haven't played that pedal probably since the early 2000s. And it was more like I heard a friend play it. So I can't really comment on that pedal. Um, it's been a while and I, I don't even remember what it, it sounded like. Um, with that, well, that was kind of, it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the, the one that's kind of like the clapped in the blues breakers type of sound? Let me know. Um, okay. Let's see some of these questions. Um, Lawrence Petras has said, I've had three less Pauls that I let go just because of that same thing. I bet it's because they didn't stay in tune. I'm not knocking Gibson, because I love Gibson, but, you know, the less... I, we were talking about this in another uh, live stream, but, you know, the headstock angle of the Les Paul is a little bit too much for me, where it doesn't stay in tune as well as the, the Epiphone counterparts. So, I bet it's that. <laughs> they play great. If they stayed in tune better, I'm all over that stuff. But that's kind of why I have, you know, I've got the Epiphone, I've got a PRS, I've got the Nags, Kenai, which is my favorite uh, LP style guitar. So I'm good. I'm good. Um, Paul P. Man is, ask, is saying, I have a Schecter... PT Fastback, which is set up like a Telecaster Deluxe, but with coil tapping. I use the coil tapping for a couple of particular tones in my old band. Do you use that with just the pickup, that the one pickup by itself, or is are you tapping the, the coils uh, when it's like in the middle position? Because I, I can do that. That, I like the tone of that, but um, I guess I, I'm not using it right. Change over before your arm goes to sleep. Oh, yeah, right? Okay, so that's that, the Red Baron. This is, uh, this was especially made for me, by the way. This is number 18, and you can't, you won't be able to see it, but he stamped my name at the end of the uh, fretboard. It says RJ, stamped in there. So I can never sell this. Um, although it says 16. Number 16, and then, oh yeah, okay, I read it wrong. It's number 16. Okay, changeover. Where's my other weird guitar? Here it is. This you've seen before. This is a Reverend. Reverend guitars. Before they were Reverend guitars now. They were Reverend guitars of East Point, Michigan, which is basically a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, that's when Joe Naylor uh, was running the company, I believe. Joe Naylor is letting Ken Haas right now run the company in Ohio. But Reverend uh, Slingshot Custom, which I bought at Joe's Music Quarters in uh, East Detroit. Is that East Detroit? East Detroit, Michigan. Um, that Joe's Music Quarters has been probably my child, it was my child, one of my childhood music stores growing up. Um, I used to go to a store called Fiddler's Music on Mac Avenue, and that was where I first started taking my first guitar lessons when I was like 10 years old. And then I switched, then I stopped taking guitar lessons, and I, then I went to Joe's Music Quarters uh, to take a couple guitar lessons. That's where I learned how to play Sweet Child of Mine. And um, anyways, uh, that store moved to a bigger location and I bought this in like 2003-ish, I would say. Um, three P90s, all proprietary Reverend wound pickups, graphite nut, uh, and this body, if you're not familiar with these old Reverends, the body is phenolic plastic, which is sort of chambered, but it's super light. Uh, I put graphite saddles, graph, graph tech saddles, and it's so not in tune. 
Uh, let's go to E. This is kind of like a half step down. Um, and I swapped uh, the tuners for these weird Grover locking tuners, which I don't know if they make anymore, but it's quite possibly the worst locking tuners I've ever used. Just because it's such an awkward design. Sonic Solution says the Unknown Henson plays a reverend. Yes, he was one of their first um, artists, if I remember correctly. I can't remember the model he was using. But the reverend design, you know, reverend guitars has put out so many different designs over the years. They don't make a phenolic body guitar anymore. Now they're making regular wood body guitars. I believe they're made in Korea. But this was all made with Detroit hands. And this guitar has been all over the world. Super thick neck, um, almost uncomfortable. Is phenolic a tone plastic? <laughs> yes. It is a tone plastic. It's all about plastic, man. But I mean, for a plastic guitar, it sounds freaking amazing, right? I mean, that's clean. Super hot P90s, too. I have found that it's pretty uh, weird depending on what kind of amp you're running through. Like these uh, middle positions can sometimes sound woofy. Uh, with an amp that doesn't have like a lot of mid-range, so like a Fender Deluxe Reverb or something. You need something with a little bit of mid-range oomph. Such as this um, LPD Anasazi Boost, which I love because it boosts the mid-range in a certain frequency that I really, really like. So here, I guess this is a demo now for LPD's uh, Anasazi pedal. This is without the pedal, straight into the quilter. See how it's kind of woofy in the low end? If I click on the Anasazi boost, it automatically kind of drops down the low end and tweaks the mids. Sounds like a Strat now, right? That's almost tellyish, right? was before that uh, Reverend put the uh, bass contour. So I feel like if there was a bass contour thing that I could cut the bass a little bit, so maybe. Uh, Paul Cartwright, good afternoon. Where are you, man? It's morning where I am. Um, let me get to some of these questions I saw. Stephen Poteet, thank you so much for your donation. That's going to the Taco Fund. Extra guacamole. Um, did I miss any other super chats? No. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, who was I talking to? Paul Cartwright. Hello. Um, someone was asking me about pickups. Oh, Tim Farnsworth. Sorry, I got your question here. Uh, do you like the Reverend Revtron pickups? I don't really have experience with those. Do they have a natural grit to them or th can they get clean chime and sound split? I couldn't tell you. I don't, I haven't really played a lot of the new Reverends. Um, so I'm not familiar with those pickups just yet. John Hopkins, I could pluck a broom and make it sound good. Thank you. That might be my next video idea. Um, uh, Daniil Kuzmachev. Hey, RJ, not sure, but guess you've, guess you've said about working with Epiphone guys or something. Am I right? Um, 
early talks about working with Epiphone as far as um, promotion overseas with them, but it's really, it was just really, you know, a brief talk. We haven't really gotten further about it just yet, uh, but I will let you know what happens with that. Matthew C., good evening from Singapore. Oh, I've always wanted to visit Singapore. I watch so many cooking shows and travel shows that go to Singapore, and I just want to go there to eat. Um, I've been through the airport and bought a $22 Singapore sling at that airport, but um, uh, if you had to choose an envelope filter for R&B Neo Soul, which would it be? Oh, gosh. Good question. What is a great envelope filter that I've played? Um, I don't own a ton. I mean, you know, the Mutron Biface is kind of the standard, but it's big and bulky. I used to have one, but it was so big that I, it was kind of too big to travel with. Um, check out, check out Solid Gold Effects. They have one called the Funk Light. They have a bigger one, and then the smaller one is the Funk Light. It's pretty simple to use, bare bones, and I don't think it's that expensive. Uh, small size, regular size pedal, but it sounds pretty close to a Mutron to me, and it's, it's easy to set. Um, I want to say that, that they have another one that does envelope filtering. Oh, gosh. I'm blanking. I've done so many pedal demos in the past couple months that... Um, what was it? I want to say, oh, um, Crazy Tube Circuits Viagra Boost. It's a boost pedal, but there's a, um, like a switch that makes it do, um, an envelope filter, which is weird. I think maybe they just kind of found it on accident, but check out that pedal as well. Uh, I see you, Stephen Poteet. Thank you so much. Uh, extra taco money, bro. Thank you so much for helping me out the week before last. Sorry I missed our last week, but wanted to kick this for helping decide on mini humbuckers versus singles in a strat. Hey, let me know what you got or what did you decide on. Thank you so much for that, uh, the taco money. Uh, last week we didn't have a, a live stream. It was CMA Fest here in Nashville and I had guests so I couldn't use my studio and I kind of wanted to take the weekend off because I was so swamped with work. And I'll tell you, um, it was good to take some time off, but it's so hard to get back on the, the horse of, of doing work like this because you kind of lose the momentum. And like even yesterday, last night, I was kind of like reluctant to do this live stream because I just wasn't feeling in the mood to, to be chatty, especially in the morning. But as soon as I got up at like 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m. this morning. I was like, raring to go. So now I feel like this, this live stream, this chat that I'm doing with you is, is getting me back into my groove. Stella got her groove back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so weird. Like, I don't consider myself like a, a workaholic, but you kind of have to. And if, if Red is still in this chat, I don't know if he's still in this chat, but my colleagues that also do uh, YouTube stuff and demo work, it's, you kind of have to work every day at this. Um, at least I do. Just to stay on top of things. And it's this mo momentum that you create. So when I stopped, you know, kind of cold turkey for, gosh, it was like five days that I didn't even touch a guitar or turn on any of my lights or cameras or do any video work. Um, it was hard to get back into it. I think, you know, I edited some videos even when I went to see Novo on Tuesday, I was kind of like, oh, I kind of don't want to film this. I'm just not feeling it, but it's just weird. So hopefully I, I don't have any more lapses in work. Although uh, next week, if anyone's going to Sweetwater Gear Fest, uh, I should be there hanging out with all my friends. So if you're going to Sweetwater next week, Fort Wayne, Indiana for the Gear Fest, Let's talk, let's meet up, let's hang out. Uh, yes. Um, ben Coombs, FYI folks, I'll be having my dad on as a guest tomorrow. Cool, so Ben Coombs is doing his live stream on Sunday and he's gonna have his guest, his dad as a guest 
for his um, Father's Day special. So everyone go to uh, check out Ben Coombs' channel Sunday night. Um, okay. Charity Scott, hello, good morning. What is your ethnicity? You look so ambiguous to me. I'm stuck between Filipino or Native American. I get this all the time, Charity. Uh, I have gotten Native American. I still get Native American. Um, I'm Filipino, 100%. Or that's at least what I was told <laughs> by my parents. Um, I've gotten Mexican. I've gotten Chinese Jamaican when I lived in Miami. If you never met a Chinese Jamaican, it's probably the coolest thing ever. Someone, a uh, mix of African and Chinese, and then they have like this deep Jamaican Patois accent, and it's so awesome. And yeah, so if you ever go to Jamaica, you might run into a, someone that looks like me, but has a really distinct Jamaican Patois accent, man. That was awful. Good question, Charity. Um, let's see here. Michael MC, have I ever tried a Keeley DDR? I tried one at the NAMM show a couple years ago. I really liked it. And I want to say I reached out to the Keeley people or maybe we were playing email tag, but nothing, nothing ever ha happened with that. But I did like it. Uh, some of the, there's some other pedals that I really liked that uh, year that they released a bunch. Um, the one that was kind of like the David Gilmour pedal I really liked. So, I don't have any Keeley pedals. Someone hook me up with the people from Keeley. Um, so this is kind of like the last guitar, weird guitar I was going to show you. Uh, every other guitar I think you've seen. Um, all this band is asking me. Where all have you lived? And sweet Beetlejuice shirt. Okay, so I grew up in Michigan, Detroit, metropolitan area. I went to school in Miami, Florida. Lived in South Florida for quite a while. Moved to Los Angeles for a couple years. And then moved to Chicago for like a year and a half and then moved to Nashville. Uh, that's basically where I've lived. Um... Morning, Audio Wizard. Okay, Paul P. Man, the Henretta Engineering Green Zapper is pretty great if you want a tiny sized auto filter with no exterior knobs. I have something to say about that because I did buy that pedal for my Thompson Square gig and I could not get it set the way that I wanted to and the fact that everything was internal and I had to keep on opening up the pedal to tweak it, I, I sold it. It's cool that it's only like the size of, can't even see this, you know, size of a little box, almost just like a tap tempo switch size, but I couldn't tweak it. And like I said earlier, um, a pedal, a piece of gear has to be, has to like be tweakable within the first one or two minutes for me to like it. So I see my compare Perfecto de Castro is, is up this morning. Good morning. Magandang umaga, perfecto. Um, let's see, Hero Glop. Hey man, I think you mentioned in earlier videos but can't find it. Can you recommend players for West Coast Blues, for example, Kid Ramos? Yes. So write this down. Kid Ramos, Hollywood Fats, Junior Watson, T-Bone Walker. He's kind of like the father of all that stuff. Um, Kid Anderson. Amazing, um, is he Norwegian or Swedish or Icelandic? I can't remember. He's European, he lives in LA. Kid Anderson. Um, um, Rick Holmstrom, although he kind of goes the line between West Coast Blues, Americana. Um, even Kirk Fletcher, if you listen to Kirk Fletcher's early albums, he does some West Coast Blues. Um, those guys. I hope I'm not missing anybody. Um, but start with that. At least Kid Ramos, Junior Watson, Kid Anderson, um, Hollywood Fats. Hollywood Fats, you might have to just go on YouTube and search out. There's not a lot of recordings 
available for Hollywood fat Hollywood fats. Um, uh, Ripcat Records. If you check out Ripcat Records, there's a lot of newer West Coast blues, uh, rockabilly. Um, it's like Southern California stuff. Is it Ripcat? I think it's called Ripcat. Uh, Tommy Harkenrider, who also does a lot of awesome videos here on YouTube. If you go to his um, website, he sells backing tracks, which I've used in some of my videos. So Tommy Harkenrider, he's like the authority on that stuff too. He's such a great educator. Um, yes, good question. Cool Beetlejuice shirt. If, you, if you're just tuning in, this, this Beetlejuice shirt was done by my friend Jonah Nimoy. Uh, go find Boredom Sketches on Instagram, uh, and you will find his artwork. You can buy these shirts. He does other designs. He does a lot of horror movie designs in a cool way. So if you're into, like, you know, Halloween, uh, Friday the 13th, um, all that stuff, Nightmare on Elm Street, really cool, hand-drawn, hand-sketched, um, Let's see, where are we at? 10.02. I got about 20, 20, 30 minutes. I know um, Mr. Red Shull is probably on his way in a little bit, so I got to get the place tidy for him. Buck Tuck 55. If you want to eat adobo, that's, the, that's what caught my attention. You said adobo. If you want to eat adobo and watching some Filipino native dance music, you should attend the Grand Canoe in Yorktown, Virginia. It happens yearly on the last weekend of July. I didn't know that. I'm not sure where Yorktown, Virginia is, but I have family, lots of family in Virginia. So uh, end of July, I'm not sure what I'm doing. If I'm available, I would love to check it out. Uh, Dad, if you're watching, keep in mind that uh, Yorktown, Virginia has the Filipino parties. 179 watching. Thank you, Ben. Um, this is a good Saturday back. It's been a while. I like to get back into my groove. Um, I got some gear demos ready for next week, so watch out for that. Um, what else? Any other questions? Ter okay, Rodora Perez, my sister is missing this episode. Yes, yeah, she is on a, a work trip. So she's probably still sleeping where she is. Okay, can we looping without pedal how? Atala lemons or Ataya lemons. Can you do looping without a pedal? Uh, you can do it with some kind of fancy tape machine. I don't know. You need something to loop, so it needs to be electronic, I would think. Uh, any chance of Harold Glup? Any chance of getting Kenny Vaughn in between two fenders? Yes, there's a chance. Uh, I haven't done a between two fenders in a while. Um, I am trying to work through a couple of videos and I've got some work trips coming up so I need to find time to make another Between Two Fenders. It could be a remote Between Two Fenders. So it might be uh, something next week at Sweetwater. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Braxel, do I ever make it out to Dallas, Fort Worth? Not so much anymore since I haven't been touring lately. Uh, I did want to go to the guitar show, but uh, maybe next year. Um, Joel B, SRV or EC? Uh, EC was my first hero, so I'm going to go with EC, Eric Clapton. Someone was asking about best tacos, oh, Pixel Monkey, best tacos in Nashville. Uh, Brax Doublefield says, Mad Taco, which I've never been to. Um... Best tacos I've ever had in Nashville. Man, I can honestly say I, I haven't had the greatest tacos. I've had good tacos. I haven't had great tacos. I want to say probably the hole-in-the-wall taco places in Antioch or off of Nolansville are probably your best bet, but that's if you like, you know, street tacos or like, taco truck type tacos, which I do. Like the little little tacos with basically onion and cilantro thrown on. Everyone loves Moss Tacos. Is that what you meant, Breck? Moss Tacos? Um, it's okay. They're pretty good. 
I want to say they're a little overrated. If, if a restaurant has a line, that's automatically a turnoff for me. And there's a way to, you don't have to wait in line there. I know a secret. Well, it's not really a secret, but there's a way to avoid waiting in line for your food. Um, but they're good. They're not the greatest. Um, and that's because, you know, you know, you're living in, in Southern California for so many years and taking trips to Mexico. It's hard to beat those, that quality of tacos, especially in Southern California. You, you know, you can get great tacos from a little hole in the wall or a little taco truck. And it's like the best tacos you've ever had. Um, so I, I haven't really been blown away yet. I can tell you all the popular taco places that people talk about on Yelp in Nashville are just, are mostly hype. You know, there's Bakersfield Tacos downtown, there's Moss Tacos, there's um, Bar Taco. Eh, they're okay. They're good. They're not great. Um, let's see here. We're talking about tacos and I'm getting hungry. Brett Schull, if you're on your way, please pick me up some tacos. Um, Krell Bar, people, it's not too hard to make tacos at home any way you want them. It's not hard to make tacos, but I feel like the prep um, to do, to make it right, and then you're, you know, if it's just you, then you're, you're either going to be left, you're going to have a lot of leftovers. And sometimes tacos over the next couple days aren't going to be that great. It's easy to make, uh, to marinate and cook the tacos. It's, it's about sourcing the right tortillas or if you're going to make the tortillas from scratch. It's kind of like sushi. Like, well, no, sushi is hard to make at home because it's so involved. But I feel like the prep for making a good taco spread, like you have to have a party. You have to have people over for, to, to go through the effort, I think, for making a huge taco spread. Unless you're fine with just making a carne asada taco. But if you want to have like a little bit of everything, sometimes it's better to go to a, uh, a restaurant so you can have, you know, a lengua taco or a, or a chorizo taco or, you know, something, a variety. As opposed, if you're going to have a, a variety uh, at home, it's, it's involved. It's a little bit of more effort than I would like to do. Red Shell, are you on your way, dude? No, take your time because I'm still on, on, on YouTube. I'm still streaming, buddy. Um, what did he say? A lot of the Nashville food scene is hyped up by all the bachelorette parties. You're probably right. That's probably a lot of, uh, people that are in town for, that are visiting, that are making these Yelp reviews. So it's not locals. Um, I want to say all the locals will go to the hole in the walls, uh, you know, on the west side or off of Nolensville Pike in Antioch. So... Someone's eating tacos, man. Uh, Alba's band, it's all about our tours in Chicago. Uh, have I ever been there? I don't think I ever been, went there. I didn't go to a lot of taco places in Chicago. I wanna say, wasn't there like a, uh, a weekly market somewhere down in, um, what's that neighborhood called? Where uh, the 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 barbecue place is? Oh God, I can't even. I can't even remember these neighborhoods in Chicago. There's so many neighborhoods in Chicago um, that I can't think of. Anyways, RJ, let's do lunch today before our thing. Uh, that might have to happen because I'm getting hungry. This coffee is making me hungry, and I had breakfast. I had like a pretty big breakfast, but I'm all amped up and I'm ready. I know a good taco place. I know a couple good taco places by my hood. We could do that, or I can meet you there. Just text me in a bit. Can you imagine where this is a guitar channel and we're talking about tacos? You know, I do the, the worst thing you could ever do, and th I do this all the time, is I'll lay in bed, and I don't know if you guys watch, you're on your phone in bed, whether you're on Instagram, Facebook, or on YouTube. I'm on YouTube watching videos, um, and I'll watch, food videos right before bed and it's probably the worst thing you can do because I'll start getting hungry right when I'm going to sleep. So when I wake up I'm starving but like I'll watch 
<laughs> I'm embarrassed to say this, but I've been watching this channel. He's got like 2 million, 1.2 million subscribers, but it's this guy that basically opens up old MREs, which um, if you're not familiar with MREs, they're the meals ready to eat that they give all the, the soldiers. Um, and he'll open up ones from like 1899. I was watching one where he opened up an MRE uh, pack from like 1899. And I'm like, dude, don't eat that. Don't eat it. And he, he ate it. It was disgusting. He ate part of it. And um, so he'll, he'll, he was, I was uh, watching one. He opened one up from like 1992. It was like a ham steak and like potatoes au gratin from 1992. And you know, the way they're designed and the way they're packaged, they're supposed to last for apparently hundreds of years. So he'll open them up, cook them up and, and eat them. And I'm just so intrigued by that. It's not the most appetizing thing, but I just, you know, and he's got 1.2 million subscribers, millions of people watch these videos. So I won't watch like, you know, those food challenges or mukbangs, but I'll watch some guy eat, you know, canned meat from 1899 for sure. <laughs> So anyways, we're talking about uh, guitar, uh, food. We should be talking about guitar. I've got about 15 minutes. Any other questions or want me to play certain guitars I have, pedals, I don't really have. I'm plugged into my LPD stuff right now, the Anasazi Boost and a Coco Pelli. And my JHS Pink Panther Delay. Have fun, play guitar. I am barbecuing baby back rigs, ribs and wings today and the wife is making lumpia. I'm coming over, let me know where you live. I'm coming over, that sounds delicious. Mark FX watches that guy, the dude is funny. Yeah, it's intriguing. I, I subscribe to some of the stupidest channels on YouTube, but you know, I watch them and they're entertaining. Um, half of YouTube is for learning or as a search engine, and the other half is just pure entertainment for me. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's also a guy on YouTube that can down 10 pounds of food in seven minutes. If he's a young guy that looks half Asian, that always wears a hat, I probably follow him as well. It's disgusting at some of the stuff he does. But he can do it. Like, I, I won't watch like the, the amateur food athletes, food athletes. I'll watch the ones that can actually like take down, you know, 30 in and out burgers and not throw up. YouTuber, that's a general name. Can you do any Leon Redbone stuff? I can't, unfortunately. I don't know any of the stuff offhand. I apologize. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Mickey Settlemeyer, I had enough MREs without watching someone else. I can imagine, man. Thank you for your service, by the way. Um, Evan Ward, contest eating is gross. Tell me about it. Have you ever seen a live con like eating contest? I So when I was touring with Thompson Square, um, we were playing somewhere in Texas. I think it was Texas. And they were having a tamale eating competition. And there was like two or three pros. Um, one was like, a, I think she was an Asian girl. The other guy was, um, what's his name? I think he won Nathan's hot dog eating contest. Uh, Ch Chester, what's his name? I don't know, but he he's like an award. He won a bunch of stuff. And I, obviously he won. But they were asking if anyone in our crew or band wanted to enter this. And of course, you know, a couple hours before our show, none of the band was going to do enter a tamale eating contest. But our guitar tech said, yeah, I'll do it. And <laughs> so I was, you know, we were all watching and it was hilarious. I think he ate seven. I forget how long it, it lasted. It might have been like... 10 minutes or five minutes. He ate seven and he 
threw up. But like um, the guy that won, whose name uh, I can't think of, um, ate something like 79. It's th it was disgusting. 79 tamales. Um, but he was doing the whole thing, you know, you dip it in the water and doing, you know, that's professional. But it's also disgusting. I, I think he won $10,000 or something. So maybe financially it's good for him. Joey Chestnut. Yes, Krellbar. Joey Chestnut is the guy that I watched win this tamale eating contest. I knew it was Chest something. I was like Chester something. Yeah, Joey Chestnut. And then there was a... a, a a girl, and then there was another guy, and they were kind of like the three real pros, and the rest were kind of like hacks, amateurs. And it was disgusting, because, you know, you you know these people aren't made for this, so. I could probably eat two tamales and be good. So, my, f my friend that ate seven, yeah, it was gross. Um... Have fun playing guitar. Are you in a band? Do you have your own band or am I doing sessions? I think that's what you meant. Uh, not anymore. You know, um, if you're just following me now, I used to be a touring guitar player. Uh, I'm kind of taking the year off and I'm just concentrating on YouTube videos and gear demo videos and gear demo work. And that's keeping me exceptionally busy this year. Uh, do I do session work? I do. On occasion, um, I go through a website called soundbetter.com. So if, if you guys need session work, uh, don't hit me up now because I'm a little busy, but hit me up in the future. So I'll record at home as well. Um, excuse me. The Sonic Solution, he'll need all that award money for his triple bypass later. That's true. That's very true. Um... Let's see, uh, wrinkled, put my deposit down on my first custom guitar. Millimetric instruments, congratulations. How much do you think your own personal guitar affects your own personal drive to play? Uh, okay, okay, affects with a net, okay. How much do I think my own personal guitar or my own custom guitar affects the, my drive to play? Um, I don't know, because I don't have, well, that's not true. I've, I've had guitars that I've designed um, to a point. I don't really get into getting into detail with designing guitars. I like to let the designer kind of take charge, and I'll just, you know, put in random suggestions or, like, if I want certain pickup configurations. But as far as the design of the neck you know, the contour and all that stuff, that's all on the designer for me. But it, it doesn't, you know, having my own personalized, customized guitar, it doesn't, you know, affect the way I play any more than a guitar off the rack or something. It's just because, you know, if I like a guitar, you know, it's because it, it plays well and I like the way it sounds. So, and that, I, I get that with different guitars and they play all differently, they all feel differently, they all have different necks. And I like that. I like that variety. So there's not one design that I can say is my personal customized design that I am comfortable with, you know, 100%. Um, so yes. Okay, guys, I got about 10 more minutes and then I got to prep for, prep for Rhett. Um, let's see here. Uh, what's your favorite meme? Uh, Cal Mulder, what's my favorite meme? I'm gonna go with the, the Ermagerd Mirsch Peturders meme. I don't know why, but that anything, anytime I see that, it's usually pretty funny. And I've, I've made memes from that, uh, photo before. Or what was it? Ermagerd Goosebump. Gersbump? Gersbumps? Uh, yeah, that's my favorite meme. It's so stupid. Uh, Matt Harrison preferred fretboard radius. Um, I mean, I have guitars that are seven and a half, seven and a quarter, all the way to like 15, you know, modern. I would safely say 10. I mean, I do like compound radius, rad, radii, 
Is that how you say it? Compound radii. Um, 10 is a good, 9, 10 is a good safe, you know, standard radius for me. Uh, when it's super vintage, you know, that's, it's a different feel. And I have a couple guitars that are, are, are Fender, you know, seven and a half, seven and a quarter, whatever it is. They're okay, but I, for the most part, I like it a little bit flatter. Um, uh, am I from Southwest Detroit? Mike Koloi, Koloian. Southwest. No, I'm from East Detroit. Southeast Detroit. Um, Medicine Man. Do I write songs instrumental too? Uh, on occasion, but nothing serious right now. I might write something for my gear demos, just like off the top of my head, that could potentially become something that I would release. But yeah, if you're wondering about my solo record, it's I haven't done anything yet. Uh, I'm still trying to get some time off to, to plan that stuff. But I would love, to, love it to happen sooner than later, much like you guys. Um, Harold Glob, do I have a Charlie Christian pickup in any guitar? No, I used to. I used to have a, a jazz guitar. It was a Gibson uh, ES-175CC. And this was a 70s model, uh, single cut, you know, the 175, single cut, hollow body. And it had one Charlie Christian pickup uh, right there in the neck. And it was such a cool guitar. Uh, it was a kind of a, it was a weak output pickup kind of noisy but it had this like really nice warm woody tone that you can't get from like a p90 or a humbucker and i sold that for a 335 but i used that guitar that was my jazz guitar in college and i think you can still find them uh it was like a 70 1974 i think mid 70s gibson uh, but i don't have any now that have a charlie christian pickup Um, okay, guys, I'm about to go soon. Uh, I'll answer a couple more questions. Um, Matt Harrison, 12 is as round as I go. I would say I like a little bit of roundness. 10 is good. I don't mind them super, super flat. But um, a little roundness to make it a little, to make me work a little bit harder, I don't mind. Uh, Truth Street, have I ever played High Watt? Um... In the studio I have, it didn't really knock me out. Uh, but then again, I didn't really have a, a chance to really play around with them. And this was probably like, oh, 10 years ago. So I don't know, maybe the newer ones are different. Um, have fun, play guitar, it gets copyright claims on all my videos. Are you going to jail? Uh, no, I don't think you're going to jail. You might not be able to monetize anything or um, sometimes, depending on the company, if they're dicks, you, they'll block your video completely. And that happened in one of my past videos, which I won't mention it because I don't want them to block it. But I had to do some fancy editing to this video to get it so it wasn't blocked by a certain company. But it was weird, like I kept on uploading it and like within 10 minutes, it was like f blocked in every single country by a certain company because I was playing a certain piece of music or showing a piece of video that they were tight ass about. So, which I won't talk about it just yet, maybe in the future. Um, Ryan Madrid, can I play Technical Difficulties by Paul Gilbert? Um, no, did I? I, I learned it at one point many years ago and I'm not even going to try to play it, but I love that song. Yes. Um, okay. Norm is asking, do I have a headless guitar? Yes, I've got a Kiesel Allen Holdsworth that I still have. If you go check out my tour vlogs from last year in Europe, you can see it in action and you can see me talk about it. So check out my tour vlogs from Europe. Um... Krellbar, good question. Have I ever had a strike on my own original material? I know that happens, has happened to some people. So, um, it wasn't a copyright strike. I don't really get strikes. 
it's just I get um, a pat on the wrist. But yeah, I got um, a, a little bit of problems with uploading RJ and the Del Guapo's material to my own channel because I used CD Baby to release my material. Technically, they own part of the copyright. So when I uploaded my own song video of my own thing, it was flagged because they saw it as uh, owned by CD Baby. And I believe I get, I get money on the back end through CD Baby and not through YouTube. So I guess it kind of works out, but it was such, it was so weird. It was like, this is my own music. I own this music and why am I getting flagged for making a video for my own song that I recorded? But it's because I went through CD Baby that legally they kind of are in charge of that stuff. Radora Perez, thank you for that. Um, thanks for the video. It's better than watching a movie on a Saturday. Hey, I'm glad I made your Saturday morning uh, excellent. Th my idea for doing the Saturday morning live streams is as like an adult version of Saturday morning cartoons. Remember how you would get up? I, I mean, if you are anywhere close to my age or older, um, getting up Saturday morning just to watch cartoons before breakfast or whatever. That's kind of that, the excitement I want you guys to have. Uh, but we're talking about guitars and tacos. So anyways, um, that's it. So I got to go because I got to, uh, I got to take care of my puppies and, uh, I guess I'm getting tacos because you guys donated so much to me for my taco Saturday morning taco fun. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I got to run. John Hopkins, John Hopkins got to run. Um, and I've, I'm sorry if I missed any of your comments. If you have any more questions, just write them down in the comments section of this video uh, later. This uh, live stream, like all my live streams are gonna be posted on my channel. So you can always hit me up, ask any questions there. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer them as much as possible. Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't buy it until I see you try to drop an anvil on a road runner's head. What was I talking about? I can't remember. What were we talking about? Um, later, Tony Tones. Thanks for joining, uh, early. Um, have fun playing guitar. Todd Flowers. I'll see you, J Road 73 Tacos, whoop whoop. The Ladyist, thank you so much. Mike, Mike Koloyan, uh, thank you for joining me. Krenar, everyone join Ben Coombs' uh, live chat tomorrow. It's a special Father's Day uh, live stream. So happy Father's Day to everyone out there. I'm gonna sign off. Uh, watch those videos on MREs. I forget the guy's name, but somebody link to his channel. Um, it's intriguing. All right, guys. I'll see you guys next weekend. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next weekend, I'm going to be in Indiana. Visit me at Sweetwater next weekend. So everyone that's going to Sweetwater Gear Fest, I'm planning on going, hopefully, uh, if something comes up. I don't know. But that's the plan. Hit me up on Instagram. Hit me up here on, on uh, YouTube. All right, guys, have a great weekend.